Well, I want to uh, thank um, everyone for coming. Thanks, you guys, for coming. Um, I really appreciate you had to. But don't think that I'm not grateful. I am. We're going to talk about that more about tonight. But those of you I know who didn't have to come, I just, last night I didn't mention this, but I, I really want to say it again. I just, I know it cost everyone here something to be here. And I just, I can't, I cannot begin to express how grateful I am. And it's not just me being grateful. I think, I really do think, and I don't, I think I'm exaggerating. I really do think that it's actually the Lord who's grateful to you. And sometimes we don't ever think that, right? We never, it's rare that we sometimes think that actually God appreciates your efforts. Sometimes we overlook that completely and think, he always wants more, he always wants more, I'm not good enough. And I just want to, if that's kind of ever been a thing that's going in your head, I just want to let you know he, he appreciates, he's so grateful. He, God is thankful for you. Not just that you're here tonight, he's thankful that you exist, but also I, I, I'm sure of this. I'm sure that God is very thankful that you made the effort and he knows the sacrifice that it took to get here. And some of you, you want to tell me the sacrifice it took <laughs> to get here. And you can if you want. But let's start with a, let's start with a big prayer. Because it's in Texas, right? <laughs> and everything's bigger in Texas. So let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, we praise and glorify your name and thank you so much for the gift of this day, and we thank you so much for the gift of faith that brings us here. Even if our faith is weak, and even if our faith has struggled, even if right now, tonight, we, we struggle with believing in you, we struggle with belonging to you, we thank you for giving us a place that we can come and be reminded of who you are and be reminded of who we are. Lord, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon everyone gathered here tonight that that your truth may penetrate their minds and your love may envelop their hearts so that you can change our lives. Jesus, tonight we give you permission. We give you permission to open our minds to your truth. We give you permission to surround and wrap our hearts in your love. And we give you permission, Jesus. Jesus, tonight we give you permission to change our lives, to give us joy. We make this prayer through the intercession and protection of the Blessed Virgin as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, just to kind of recap a little bit of what we talked about last night. You might not have been here last night. Maybe you were, and you might have forgotten everything. So just a quick thing. When it comes to Lent, it's a great time for us to enter into the season, what they called in the early church, and we still call it, a season of purification and enlightenment. Basically, where in my life do I still need to kind of get rid of some stuff, and where in my life do I need to know more about the Lord? Because when you, in the early church, if you were going to become a Christian, if you were going to become a Catholic, that meant leaving your old worldview and adopting an entirely different worldview. Last night we talked about some of the ways that worldview had to change when it came to even looking at other people. In the early church, or in the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, they looked at human beings as simply just being, you know, just, I, basically the Nazis kind of took this and said life, unworthy of life. That there are some beings, some humans, that were unworthy of life. And in the ancient world, in Greek culture and Roman culture, they had the same kind of idea. But when Christianity came on the scene, it realized it had this new truth. And this truth was this, that every human being was made in the image and likeness of God. And that was unheard of before Judeo-Christianity arose. No one ever thought that. I mean, just think about it. our entire culture, our entire society, our government is based off of this idea that all human beings are created equal, which never, never, never existed until the Bible. It changed the way we look at other human beings. And that there's literally no such thing as life unworthy of life. If there's human life, that's whether it goes from the greatest genius in the world to the least genius in the world, that life is made in God's image and likeness. I just think about this a lot, and I'm so grateful for it because I have my god, one of my goddaughters um, is my, my niece, her name is Marin. And Marin is devel developmentally disabled. And I just, think about, I just think about the truth that God speaks over Marin and speaks into the hearts of everyone who meets her, and that's this, that Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, 
have, don't have more dignity than Marin. I just think that's amazing. In the ancient world, no one would have thought that. They would have thought, no, no, no. The geniuses, they have more dignity. They have more worth. But in Christianity, this whole new world view, we realize, no, actually, Marin has just as much dignity. She is just as much created in God's image and likeness as anyone. It's a whole change in worldview. But also, not just a change in how we looked at other people, it's actually a change in how we look at God. Did you realize that before Christianity came on the scene, in all other world religions, none of them ever believed that the gods were good. I mean, they all had gods. The Greeks had their gods. The Romans had their gods. You have different deities in other religions. And they were there, and they were powerful, but none of them were good. If you ever read any of the stories, the Greek myths, the Roman myths, they're powerful. They could sometimes help you, but they weren't good, and they didn't care about you. Sometimes you could get their attention. That's how actually what you do. If you wanted to get Mars' attention because you're going into battle, you wanted to win, what you would do is you go into the temple of Mars or the temple of Ares, and you would cut yourself until you bled, or you'd sacrifice a human being to show that, Mars, pay attention to me, listen to my prayer, give me what I want. Because Mars doesn't care about you. Mars is not good. And then along comes Jesus and reveals that actually, not only, not only is God good, not only does he care about you, but God actually loves you. And just, if you don't remember anything from tonight, think of this, that at every single moment, of your life. God isn't just watching you, because that's creeps some people out. <laughs> yeah, I don't like the idea that God is watching me. But at every single moment of your life, God is not merely watching you, God is attentive to you. God has an infinite amount of attention that he's directing right at you at every moment. When no one else is paying attention to you, God, the God, not like, you know, like some kind of subclass God, but the God of the universe is always attentive to you, which means what? Which means you never have to fight to get his attention. Sometimes we fall into this trap of thinking that we need to do something big to get God's attention. The reality is he's already paying attention to you. In, in fact, the very desire to pray, the church teaches this, the Catholic Church teaches this, the very desire to pray, actually God, that was God in, inviting you to pray. So whenever you want to pray, that's actually God saying, hey, talk to me. You don't have to fight to get his attention. Why? Because he is good, and he cares about you, and he loves you. And that's what we talked about last night, right? There are these four truths. I, we, I didn't define them into four, but here's the thing. Here are the four truths. One, number truth number one, God is good, and this world is good. God is good, this world is good. God is good, good and he created this world good. But truth number two is this. We sinned, and we separated ourselves from God. And we talked about the unbridgeable gap, right? The unbridgeable, unbridgeable chasm between God and us. We're on one side is God, and on the other side is us, and this, because of sin, there's this unbridgeable chasm. And no matter how hard we might try to get from this side to that side, there's something about an unbridgeable chasm. And what is that? It's unbridgeable. So someone's going to say, it's a chasm. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So then the third truth is this, that Jesus Christ, God himself, became one of us, and he bridges the gap. And the great image of God bridging the gap with him on one side and us on the other side is the crucifix. That he's, he's the bridge with God on one side, us on the other, and he bridges the gap between God and us. And that's why Jesus says, I'm, there's no other way to the Father except through me. Not because he's being arrogant, because you think about it, if there is this unbridgeable chasm and only one bridge crosses, is it arrogant to say, hey, there's only one bridge. No, it's just accurate. It's not arrogant. It's just true. And so you have this reality. First truth, God is good. He created the world good. Second truth, sin separates us from God. The third truth, God himself bridges the gap. And the fourth truth is this. We have the ability, we have the opportunity, we have the invitation to make the decision, not just to believe in that, but to belong to that. We have the invitation to actually stake our entire lives on that truth and experience the new life that God offers. And this is crazy. Just, I want to put a pin in this right now and just pause this for a second. Because this is, this is radical stuff. This is completely new stuff. And you might say, why should I believe that? And I would say, the only reason, I tell this to my students all the time, the only reason to believe anything is because it's true. If it's not true, then we should not believe it. If Christianity isn't true, then not only should you not be in this church, 
we should be actively fighting to stop Christianity from spreading. The only reason to believe anything is because it's true. So here's the question. Is it true? I just want to circle around this for about five minutes. Is Christianity true? I know. I'm going to establish that Christianity is true in under five minutes. That's not what's going to happen. And sometimes we look at religions, we say they're all the same, you know. How do you know? And one thing we forget is this. We forget sometimes that Christianity, that Catholicism, it's a historical religion. It's like it's based in history, it's based in things that actually happened. And there were people there to watch it happen. That, that Jesus comes on the scene. Imagine this. Imagine someone walked into the room. Imagine someone dressed in a really nice suit walked into the room and he said, Hello everyone. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Would you be like, okay. Like, I think sometimes we think like, well, back in the day they did. They were just so dumb back then, you know? They didn't even know how to program VCRs. They didn't know what iPods were. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And they're like, okay, Jesus. You know, this kind of, like they were so idiot. No, Jesus comes on the scene and he claims to be God. If, if a person came into this church and said, I'm God, what would you say you have to do in order for me to believe in you? You prove it, exactly. You have to prove it. So here's Jesus, and that's what he does. If you ever read the Gospels, and especially the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus came and he performed signs and wonders. In fact, not just miracles, there were signs and wonders. What do signs do? Signs point to something. So Jesus' miracles were not just because he loved the people who were hurting, although he does, but Jesus' miracles are pointing to, he says, before Abraham was, I am. Prove it. So he goes to this little girl, 12 years old. She died. Jesus goes up to her and he takes her by the hand. And he says, Talitha kum, little girl, arise. And this little girl who was dead is now alive. Now sometimes we think like, well, he just, you know, did CPR. You can picture Jesus going up to her like, come on, breathe. You never give up anything in your life. Don't give up now. Like, no, he just took her by the wrist. Little girl, get up. And the dead girl is now alive. At one point, this man who's paralyzed, and he's lying on this mat, and his friends lower him from the roof, right? And Jesus looks at their faith, the faith of the friends, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And they're saying, wait, who but God can forgive sins? Which is a very good question. And Jesus is like, no one. So watch this. Pick up your mat and go home. And the man who was paralyzed, not only, I love this, not only can he get up, but the man, he knows how to walk. I think that just blows my mind. That he's never been able to walk, and all of a sudden you pick up his mat and walk home. And that's how deeply his healing goes, and that's how deeply Jesus proves that he is who he says he is. Now, if he had done this in secret and no one ever saw it, that'd be one thing. But the greatest miracle is that when, and there's so many of them, but at one point, Jesus died, right? We have the crucifix. At one point, Jesus died in front of all of these people. They saw him dead. They prepared his body for burial. He was in the tomb for how many days? Three days. And then he rises from the tomb, and people see his resurrected body. In fact, St. Paul says at one point, Jesus appeared to over 500 people. And St. Paul writes this to the Corinthians, and he says, at one point, Jesus appeared to over 500 people. Some have died. But most of them are still alive. Now, why would he say that? He says this because he's writing to them saying, if you question what I'm saying, it makes, makes sense. Go ask them. They're still alive. No, that's the reality. This, this radical difference of Christianity between even something like, I don't want to pick on anyone else, but like, think of like Mormonism. Here's Joseph Smith who goes in the Pennsylvania woods. And he comes out and he says, I've got this book that I, I it's in my handwriting. Wait, where'd you get that? Well, an angel appeared to me. His name is Moroni. And he showed me where these golden tablets were buried. And they were written in a different language. And so I transcribed them. Like, wow, that's an amazing story. Where's the angel? Took off. Okay, well, where are the golden tablets? Took them with him. Well, what language was written in? It was a language only I could understand. Did anyone see this? Yeah, not really. But check out my book. I mean... Why would we believe that? But here, when it comes to Christianity, it was, did anyone see this miracle? Absolutely. Did anyone see this miracle? Right. I mean, even the crazy thing is the Gospels were written within 20 years of the resurrection. Some of the Gospels were written within 20 years of the resurrection. So, so much so that if you read them, you go, wait a second, is this true? You'd be able to go back to the place and say, did you see this? Yes, we saw this. 
Christianity is an historical, historical religion. The only reason to believe it is because it's true. And so we have to, like, but it's not just enough to believe it. I just love this thing. Some people will say, though, this, they'll say this, they'll say this. Maybe the apostles were lying. Maybe, like, the 12 got together, or the 11 plus Matthias, 12 again. Maybe they got together, and they were lying. They said, we saw Jesus rise from the dead, and they were just faking. Get your story straight. Okay, it was three days, right? Three days. I want to say four. No, no, three days. No, and say, yeah, they got it because they wanted to be, like, in charge. Like, Peter wanted to be the first pope. And we sometimes imagine that because we think of, like, this pope. Like, he gets to live in a nice place. Everyone's like, oh, hey, Holy Father. Like, you know, that's what Peter wanted to be. He wanted to be, like, the number one guy. So he made up this whole story. Think, okay, <laughs> what did the 12 apostles get if they made up the story? What did they get from making up the story? Well, every single one of them got tortured. Eleven of them were martyred, were killed. St. Peter was crucified upside down. St. Paul was beheaded. Um, St. Andrew, St. Lawrence was, like, grilled alive. St. Andrew was flayed alive. You know what that means? Okay, this is a little to, to these guys. Because it's gross and they like this. You know what being flayed alive means? It means literally being skin, have your skin taken off while you're still alive. Yeah, there you go. Blech. So, because that was like, they're into that kind of thing. I don't know. Right? So being, what did they get for the, what did they get for the trouble? John, the only one who didn't get martyred, he was boiled alive multiple times. Now, Chuck Colson, I mentioned him last night. Chuck Colson was a guy, if you remember, some of you might know Chuck Colson's name. He used to work for Nixon during Watergate. And then he became a Christian after that. But Nixon has talked about this and said, you, you're telling me that these 12 guys, not just the 12, but Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of God, all the other disciples, they stuck to this story even in the midst of being tortured, imprisoned, and killed. He said, there were six of us at Watergate who knew the story. And we got together after Watergate kind of was leaking, and we said, okay, you guys, here's our story. And these guys were like hardcore, like tough as nails kind of guys who were like, you know, take no prisoners, and like, we're going to stick to this story, and if we stick to this story, no one gets in trouble. And he said within two weeks, every single one of them made a deal to tell their story. Two weeks. Of, and the threat was, you might go to a minimum security prison for maybe three years. <laughs> Compare that to, we're going to take your skin off while you're still alive. This, this recognition of the veracity of Scripture, the veracity of the truth of the story, actually even touches on the people who said, no, this is true. If I was making it up, as soon as they were like, hey, we're going to use this tweezers to pluck out your nose hairs, I'd be like, okay, I made it up! But no one, and the fact is this, not, well, there's not one record of anyone ever who said, I saw the resurrection, even under the pain of death, ever saying it wasn't true. No one's ever said it. And if, that, if, if they ever did, you'd think that the authorities who wanted to stop Christianity would have said, no, 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 so-and-so, they recanted their story, but it never happened. What's that to say? That's to say, that's to say that the facts are really in the favor of the story. This whole notion that here is Jesus, the bridge of the gap. He is who he says he is. He is God. And so now the question is this. Do I want to stake my life on him? Do I want to not just believe the story? Do I want to belong to him? Because I'm invited to not just believe the story. I'm not just invited to see Jesus. I'm invited to belong to Jesus. And this is a great story. I love this story from Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 19. And it so, so many ways captures how we're called to take these next steps. And it's a story you've all heard, and here's how it goes. It says that Jesus came to Jericho, and he intended to pass through the town. Now a man there's name was Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector and also a wealthy man. He was, wish he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But he couldn't, because he was short in stature. I love these details that they give, you know? Like they couldn't just say, like Zacchaeus is like, really, you had to say that? You had to say it's because I was short. Man, why don't you just say I couldn't see him? <laughs> he was seeking to see who Jesus was. It's one of those things, like maybe he's standing right here, saying, like, I want to see who that is. I want to know who Jesus is. All he wanted to do was maybe keep his distance to say, let me see some miracles, if this is the, the deal. People saying that this guy can raise the dead. They say he can heal the sick. They can give sight to the blind. I want to see that. He just wanted to see Jesus, but then it goes on. He ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus. He just wanted to see him. He was about to pass that way. And then when Jesus reached the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, for today I must stay at your house. 
Now, this is the invitation that God has for every one of us. It's this, it says, I know your name. I mentioned this to the, to the youth on Sunday night. God never, God doesn't love y'all. God loves you. He doesn't love groups of people. He loves individuals. One of the ways to say it is God's love is not like an atomic bomb, just like indiscriminately blows up. God is a sniper. And he shoots love bullets. Which is dumb. <laughs> but he does. But like, I know that's a dumb image. But, but this idea that God looks at Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house. That's what he says to all of us. We just want to see him. But he says, no, no, no. I know your name. I don't just want you to see me. I want you to stay at my house. Now, what it, what it meant to stay at someone's house back in the ancient world was this. Here's Jesus inviting himself over for a meal. If you're part of a meal in the ancient world, it meant your family. To share a meal in the ancient world meant you now had a bond. It was called a kinship bond. If you shared that meal, it's not like, hey, let's get some coffee. Okay, we'll talk. It's like, no, actually, come to my, I want to go to your house and eat your food, which means I want to be in your life. Zacchaeus, I want to know you. I want to be part of your family. I want to be part of your life. Now, for us, maybe you were raised Catholic. If you are raised Catholic, raised Christian, we'd be like, oh, man. <sighs> Whatever. Jesus wants to stay at my place. He wants me to change my life. We can resent this idea that God wants, I want to stay at your house. But what is Zacchaeus' response? Zacchaeus' response is this. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down quickly. I must stay at your house. I want to be part of your family. I want to be in your life. Don't just see me. I want to be with you. It says, Zacchaeus came down quickly and received him with joy. Zacchaeus came down quickly and received him with joy. Which I think is just, it blows my mind sometimes. We'll talk about joy tonight a little bit. Zacchaeus I must stay at your house. I must be part of your life. And he comes down quickly. He says, I, and receives him with joy. There's a man named Leon Blois. Leon Blois said this. He said, joy is the infallible sign of God's presence. Joy is the infallible sign of God's presence. Wherever there is joy, God is there. It's the infallible sign that he is present. Here is Zacchaeus, and he comes down and receives Jesus with joy. And joy, that experience of joy, is the infallible sign of God's presence. Even further, a man named G.K. Chesterton, he once said that he's a convert to Catholicism. He was an atheist, and then he became a Catholic. He was a writer in the, in the, Engli in Eng in the English language in England back in the beginning of the last century. And when he became Christian, he said this. He said, he said, joy is the gigantic secret of the Christian. So I want to just ask the question, like, is that, is that what people think of when they think of the Catholic Church? When they think of Catholics. Joy is the infallible sign of God's presence. God is here. That do, do, do people think, when they think Catholic, do they think that joy is that gigantic secret of the Christian? When people think of whether it's this parish or just the Catholic Church in general, is the one word that comes to mind joy? Or is it a different word? Like, what do people most think when they think Catholic? What's one word they think when they think Catholic? Strict rules. A lot of times, it starts with a G, ends with an ilt. Guilt, right? <laughs> like, most times when people think of Catholic, they think of guilt. In fact, we even have a term for it in our culture. We call it Catholic guilt. I mean, I don't know how many times I've had people say, like, oh, yeah, well, I was raised Catholic, but I got a dose of that Catholic guilt. Or they do something wrong, and they're like, oh, my, it's that Catholic guilt kicking in. My mom would always say this about Catholic guilt. She says, there's nothing Catholic about guilt. It's just called guilt. <laughs> like, if you do something wrong, the proper response is, you should feel guilty. That's actually, that's a sign of things actually going well. When you do something wrong and you feel guilty about it, that means something's working. I mean, it did not have that would be like Dexter, right? I mean, that's, it's called human behavioral disorder. That's being a psychopath. When you do something wrong and you don't feel guilty, that means, yeah, don't come over to our house for dinner. Guilt is a sign that I've done something wrong and I feel bad. Now, we might think, like, yeah, but to, to not to be free of guilt, that'd be so great. You guys know of a person named Tony Dungy? Tony Dungy, coach for the Colts. 
Um, he actually coached um, in Minnesota for a while too, but Tony Dungy, before one of his, um, before one of his NFL championship wins, the night before, he was giving an interview. And the interviewer was asking Tony, you know, because you know, he he's a pretty professed Christian, they're asking about his family. And Tony Dungy was talking about one of his kids. One of Tony Dungy's kids was born with this really rare condition where he doesn't feel pain. He can touch stuff, but he never feels pain. And so Tony Dungy went on to say, he said, you might think that that's great. You might think that that's what a blessing. But he said, for our family, though, it's been a curse. Because when my son was four years old, he knows that he loves how warm chocolate chip cookies taste. And so he doesn't know any better than to reach into the oven while it's 450 degrees to grab the hot tray and to pop a scalding cookie into his mouth. Meanwhile, his hands are blistered and burned, his tongue and his throat is caked with burns because he can't feel the pain. So he doesn't know that it's hurting him. He says, you might think it's a blessing, but for our family, it's been a curse. To not feel the heat burning him is nothing good. And same thing, to not feel the sting of guilt when we do something wrong, that wouldn't be a blessing, that would be a curse. And it's, sometimes it's interesting because sometimes we think that, like, you know, sin pricks my conscience. But that's not true. Sin doesn't prick our conscience. Sin deadens our conscience. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you go to a sin and you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, and you feel less and less guilty about it. Sin doesn't prick our conscience. Sin deadens our conscience. God pricks our conscience. Joy, the joy that we've lost sometimes, that's the thing pricks our conscience. I would say guilt no more kills joy than pain burns us. Guilt no more kills joy than pain bur burns us. What kills joy? Not the guilt of sin. Sin kills joy. I want to talk about it a little bit tonight. If, we are, if our goal is joy, what are some of the things that we invite into our lives that kill joy? And the first thing is just the obvious one. It's the one I've already mentioned. Sin. Sin is one of the things that kills joy. I mean, I'd say two things about sin. Sin makes us sad, and sin makes us stupid. <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, it's like, this is, this is something I think we've all learned, that sin makes us stupid. I don't know how many people I talk to on a regular basis who are like, I did the dumbest stuff because, why? Because I was drunk. I did the dumbest stuff, why? Because I was inflamed by passion. I did the dumbest stuff, why? Because I was in sin. I just kept doing dumb stuff. Sin makes us stupid, but sin also, it also makes us sad. You ever had this experience where you're having an otherwise fantastic day? Otherwise, just everything's going really, really well, and it's a beautiful day. Maybe like today, like the, you, got, you have no idea. This day today was like, blew my mind, blew my, blew my mind, because I'm like, again, as Father Tom said, back home, I'm like, it's snowing, it's miserable, everything's icy and salty and gray, and here, I'm just like, God, thank you so much. You ever have days like today, where you realize, you think, I should be happy. Like, work's going well, my family's going well, the day's gorgeous, but you're sad, and you realize, why am I sad? Oh, that's right. I've been carrying around this sin all day. It's just weighing me down. Like, the church doesn't hate sin. God doesn't hate sin, because that's where people have fun, and he doesn't want you to have fun. God hates sin because sin makes us sad. Because sin makes us sick. Because sin... It steals our joy and makes us sad. And there's another guy in the gospel. It's actually the chapter right before Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 18. And he knew all about this. He says that Jesus, this young man approached Jesus and asked him, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You should not commit adultery, you should not kill, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. That's what you should do. And the young man replied, all of these I have observed from my youth. Basically, this guy's like, yeah, I do that already. What else do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And it says this, Jesus, in another place of scripture, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, there is still one thing left for you. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. Here's this invitation, the same invitation that Zacchaeus had. See, it's coming down. I want to stay at your house. 
I want you to be part of my family. And in this case, it says this. It says, when he heard this, the young man became quite sad, for he was very rich. This, at this, the young man, his face fell, and he walked away sad, because he was very rich. And this reality, I mean, we might not get it. It says here, he became quite sad. That's a pretty bad, and bad translation. The actual word that Luke uses for him becoming sad is the exact word that, G, that Luke uses to describe Jesus going through his agony in the garden. I mean, when he says Jesus became grieved and began to sweat drops of blood, that's the exact same word that this young man experiences. He was invited. He was invited to be part of God's mission. He was invited to be, have a bigger life than he had, and he just couldn't do it. He wanted what he wanted more than he wanted God, and so he went away grieved because he had many possessions. It's this crazy, it's this, it's this crazy thing. Zacchaeus had joy. And he was willing to give away everything. He says, Lord, I'll give away half my income. If I've defrauded anyone, I'll repay them four times what I stole from them. The other man, he'd say he went away sad because maybe the fear of, what does Jesus want to take away from me? I think sometimes when we approach Jesus and he says, I know your name and I want you to be a part of my family, we, we shrink back because we think, like, what does Jesus want to take away from me? I'll tell you what he wants to take away from you. He wants to take away your sadness. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it to the full. What does he want to take away from you? He wants to take away your slavery, whatever you're enslaved to, whatever you're bound to. He wants to take away your sin. Our problem is sometimes we're more afraid of what Jesus wants from us than we are excited about what Jesus wants for us. And so a lot of times Jesus says, I want... Listen, be part of my life. And we walk away grieved because we're afraid of what it's going to cost. And all he wants, all he wants. Pope Benedict even said this. He says, we approach God, the only thing we can give to him is our sin. But every time, every time you give him your sin, he gives you his glory. All we can offer God is our sin. But every time we do, he in return gives us his glory. This guy, I just think about this, this young man, the rich young man. He knew what he valued. I mean, look at his life. He was a good guy. He kept the commandments. He probably prayed. He was probably a good kid. He was top of his Sunday school class, or Saturday school class. And he knew what he valued. But he didn't have the strength to choose what he valued. His values didn't become his virtues. You know, there, I, there was a, there's always new people coming to campus at university. Just a little while ago, a young man, he came to my house and he's like, okay, so Father, I need to ask you a question. He said, um, so I'm Catholic and I believe, I love Jesus. And he said, but I, but I experience same-sex attraction. So he said, so I got to know, is, 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 is why I belong in the Catholic Church? Experience same sex attraction, do I belong in the Catholic Church? Like, yeah. <laughs> it was, I didn't like, like, yes, idiot. I was like, well, yeah, of course you do. I mean, because he had this big question, like, do I belong here? I'm like, absolutely, 100% you belong here. Everyone belongs in the Catholic Church. It doesn't matter what you struggle with, what you wrestle with, what your wounds are, what your attractions are, every person in the world belongs in the Catholic Church. Because why? Because God loves every person in the world, regardless of our wounds, regardless of our failings, regardless of our attractions. And the question I said for him is this, what are you going to let define you? Are you going to let your attraction rule how you follow Jesus? Or are you going to let your following Jesus rule how you live out your attraction? This is for all of us, not just for that guy. Because all of us have wounds. All of us have an attraction to sin. All of us have stuff in our lives that we would rather do. And a lot of times what we'll do is this, we'll say, I'm going to define myself first by my whatever that thing is, that wound, that sin, that attraction. And that's going to govern how I follow Jesus. But that's exactly the opposite. What we do is we first say, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life. And now, your lordship now defines how I live out or how I don't live out this wound, this failure, this attraction. You know, a number of years ago, Pope John Paul II said to me, and like a million other people at World Youth Day. He said, 
but he looked right at me and he said this. He said, you are not defined by your weaknesses or your failures or your sins. So many times we define ourselves by our weaknesses, our failures, or our sins. Say, that's me, that's who I am. And John Paul II, man, that guy. He looked at a million youth, young people and their adult chaperones, and he said, you are, you are not defined by your weaknesses or your failures or your sins. You are defined, he said, you are defined by the sum of the Father's love for you. And by your capacity to be an image of Jesus to the world. What defines you? Not what defines me. If I let my wounds define me, you guys, I would never be here. If I let my sins define me, I, would, I wouldn't even come into a church. I think I'd burst f- on fire. I would never touch holy water. Like, ow! It's, you know, one of those. But John Paul II tells me this truth. He says, but Father Mike, your wounds, your sins, your attractions, your failures do not define you. That defines you. The sum of the Father's love is what defines you. And your capacity to be an image of Jesus to the world, that's what, that's what defines you. So you don't have to be afraid. Here's the guy, rich young man. What are you going to let define you? Jesus or your wealth? Well, I'm going to stay wealthy as long as, and that'll define how I follow Jesus. It has to be the other way around. I follow Jesus, and that defines what I do with my wealth. And here's this guy, and he walks away from his mission because he's afraid of what it's going to cost. He walks away from his mission because he's afraid of what it's going to cost. Because i got to tell you guys this. It is easy, it is easy to live a mediocre life. And we all know this. It is easy to live a mediocre life. All you have to do is just not decide. All you have to do is just not make a decision. All you have to do is just not choose. All you have to do is just go with the flow. You know, it's interesting. My dad was up in Alaska a number of years ago. He's fishing. And uh, he said the fishing was great, and all the, all the fish are going upstream, and they're spawning upstream, and all this kind of thing. And he, he said, as he was standing on the, on the riverbank, you know, day after day, just fishing in this beautiful Alaskan wilderness, he noticed that all these fish are going upstream to spawn. All these fish are going ag- against the current, except for one kind of fish. He said he noticed one kind of fish that was, out of all the other fish going upstream, was the only one going downstream. And I said, which one? He said, the dead ones. <laughs> it's easy. It's easy to go with the flow. It's easy to go with the current. It's easy to live a mediocre life. All you have to do is not decide. Just don't decide. Or follow your heart. That's a great recipe for a mediocre life. Just follow your heart. I would say, I would say what people have said before. Say, don't just follow your heart. Lead your heart. Because your heart, if you follow it, will lead you astray. Don't just follow your heart. Lead your heart. Make a decision to choose. Another thing, another thing about heart. Not just sin, it's just always joy, not just fear. And not just that mediocre, not choosing, but there's another thing. It's, it might call it this, you might call the wayward heart. One of my favorite, one of my heroes of the Bible is a guy named David. You know, David in the Old Testament, he's like one of my absolute favorites. You know the story of David as a young man, is David, he was out in his father's field, he was a shepherd, he's the youngest of all of his sons, he's anointed. He's, here's the thing about David, David is anointed out of all of his brothers, even though his older brothers all look like they'd be better kings than David. Samuel, the, the prophet, goes to David's father, and God says, not that one, not that one, not that one, sees David and says, that's the one, that's the one, and then Samuel, the prophet, anoints David as the next king of Israel. And the Holy Spirit, God, comes upon David. And he begins this life. And so David's the guy, right? I love it, because David, from, even from being a kid, it's, it's, he describes how he used to live. Before he even fought Goliath, David at one point gets um, in front of Saul, and he says, I'm going to fight Goliath. No one else wanted to fight this giant. And David says, I can do this. So Saul, the king, says, you can't fight Goliath, because he's you're just a, a youth, and he's been a soldier from his youth. And David says this to Saul, I love it, he says, he says, your servant, meaning himself, used to tend his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear attacked it, I would rush after it and beat it. And if it grabbed any of my father's sheep, I would grab it by the jaw and strike it until it let my father's sheep go. And I've killed a lion and a bear. And this Philistine will be just like one of them. 
because he's a, he has blasphemed the name of Almighty God. You think, like, David's not like a pushover. Like, David's like a dude. He's like this 14 year old kid who's like, yeah, so when I, I tend my father's sheep, I play a lot of Nintendo. Play a lot of Halo, you guys. So it's, I'm kind of, I'm ready to take on Goliath. No, David has been out there and he's been living like a man. He's been living on mission. He's anointed by the Lord. And what he does is he trains himself. And he puts himself in battle and he goes, I, I grab a lion or a bear by the throat and I beat it until it lets go of my father's sheep. This is the kind of guy that David is. That's why I'm just like, man, this guy is a stud. And then he faces a Goliath. And he defeats him, and then it goes on. And he just defeats people after people, and he saves his people and sets them free. And then David becomes the king. And in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it says this. Now David's been a great king. He's been on mission. He's been on point. He's got his mission from Samuel. He's anointed by the Holy Spirit to be the king who will lead Israel. And then in chapter 11, everything turns, and it says this. At the time of the year when kings go out on campaign, so when kings go to fight, no, sometimes we think, like kings, like they reign from their throne. They kind of have their crown and their scepter and they say, do this and do this and bring me more figs. But in the ancient world, a king's job was to protect, defend, and fight for his people. That's what a king was supposed to do. A king's job was to lead his armies into battle, not command them from his throne. And so it says, at the time of the year, when kings go on campaign, when kings go into battle, David sent out Joab along with his officers and the army of Israel, and they fought the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. So David's mission is very clear. David, you're the king. Go and fight for your people. But he sent out other people to do his job. And then he said, David, however, remained in Jerusalem. So this is the, this is the first little cue, the first little clue that David's not doing what he should be doing. David has a mission, and his mission is to be the king, the father of the people, and fight for them but he sent out someone else to fight for him and for his people. Meanwhile, he remained back in Jerusalem. And then things get, they go from bad to worse in verse 2. One evening, David rose from his siesta and strolled about the roof of his palace. I mean, seriously, you're supposed to be out on the battlefield. And he's just taking a nap, taking a walk on his palace. From the roof, he saw a woman, woman bathing who was very beautiful. And then David, at that point, rather than going like, whoa, going back inside. David had inquiries made about the woman. He was told, she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam. Oh, the wife of Joab's armor bearer, Uriah the Hittite. Oh, she's married. Okay, whoa, Ew, easy there. David then sent his messengers and he took her. Now here is David, and David's job is to be on mission and fight for his people. Meanwhile, he sent someone else out to do his job. And then while they were gone, he took one of their wives. I want her, I claim her. Bring her to me. Because why? Because that's what we say. When it comes to sin, we say, I want what I want. I want what I want, when I want it, whenever I want it, with whomever I want it. And that's what David is able to do, because he's the king. He took... Bathsheba, and he becomes an adulterer. Now, he didn't start out as an adulterer, but it even gets worse. Then, I'll just sum up the story. Bathsheba turns out that she's pregnant. You might know this story already. Turns out Bathsheba gets pregnant from David, and so David says, oh gosh, how do I cover my tracks? So he gets Uriah from the field and says, Uriah, come and have supper with me. And he gets Uriah drunk with the idea that Uriah is going to go back home drunk and have relations with his wife. And then he'll think that it was him, his child. Uriah is a man living on mission. So Uriah goes back and sleeps with the soldiers at the gate. David hears about that. He's like, okay, no, 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 okay. Gets him back the next night. Gets him even more drunk and says, go back and sleep with your wife. And Uriah says, listen, I cannot sleep with my wife when my brothers in arms are sleeping on the field and fighting for you, David. So David says, okay, I can't, I can't trick this man who's on mission to be a man off mission. So what he does is he sends word, he gives him a note, sealed. Gives it to Joab and says, put Uriah in the thick of the fight. And when the fighting gets really, really hard, everyone draw back and let Uriah get struck down. And David has gone from just a king who wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing, living off mission, to becoming an adulterer, to becoming a murderer. Now rarely, that rarely happens in one day. It didn't happen for David in one day. 
It happened the moment that David stopped living on mission and started living what you might call a shadow mission. Everyone here has a mission. Every person here, you have a mission. The question is, when you live your mission on joy, when you live on mission, you live with joy. But when we start living a shadow mission, it starts to steal joy. And I imagine that everyone here knows what it's like to live on mission. And just the joy of being like, yes, I am living as the man or the woman that God wants me to be. And we probably also know what it's like to live our shadow mission. And maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't start off in this devastating way, but it almost always, always leads to something like David. I remember hearing about shadow mission for the first time, and there was a men's retreat. And they were talking about shadow mission, and that night, all the guys were sitting around a fire, and one of the guys, he's poking at the fire, you know, in one of those kind of lulls where everyone's talking smart and figuring out the world's problems, and he just wanted to be honest, and he's poking at the fire, and he's like, guys, men, I have to be honest with you. He said, my shadow mission is when my wife and my kids and everyone in my house goes to sleep, I stay up and watch inappropriate movies and abuse myself while the rest of the world goes to hell. And everyone, the guys in the circle kind of laugh like, huh, yeah, you're, we're uncomfortable now. <laughs> and he said, no, listen, listen. My shadow mission is when my wife is sleeping in our bed and my kids have been put to sleep. I stay up and I watch inappropriate movies and do stuff while the rest of the world goes to hell. And he knows as a dad, I've got a mission. Like David, I'm the father of this nation. I'm the father of this family. What am I doing? I'm not living on mission. I'm living my shadow mission. And shadow missions always, always steal joy. So I want joy. What do I have to do? Live on mission. That doesn't mean it's not going to cost you. You know what living on mission costs? Living on, living on mission leads to that. I and mean, this is, talk about someone who lives on mission. Here's Jesus himself who goes into the garden. Father, please, please, in the middle of the night, I just, not my will, but if your mission, if the mission I have to live out is going to lead to this, then not my will, but your will be done. Your shadow mission will cause you suffering. But living on mission, it might cause suffering, but it will always lead to joy. There is no kind of suffering like living your shadow mission. There's also no kind of joy like living on mission. Almost no kind of joy like living on mission. Because yes, suffering is involved with living on mission, but also joy is involved with living on mission. Zacchaeus was living on mission. Even though it cost him half of his, half of his income and four times what he had robbed from people. But it's worth living on mission for joy. The next thing. Another thing that kills, mission, it kills, kills joy. For just, just kind of, you're like, okay. Another thing? Yes, another thing. Another thing that kills joy is worry. You know, I know that when I say worry, some people are like, oh man. Yeah, I'm a worrier, okay? It's what I do. I'm like really good. It's like my spiritual gift. And maybe you've been as someone who's always been worried. I'm a worrier. I actually remember hearing about the study they did that they did a study with cats, and apparently a certain percentage of cats, like actual cats, you know, um, cats are just naturally predisposed to being higher strung. And apparently they did studies with human beings, and roughly the same percentage of people are just kind of normal, naturally, just a little bit more higher strung. So if you're just someone who's just a little bit more higher strung, go easy on yourself, be patient with yourself, but sometimes we choose to worry, and we worry about things that are ridiculous. I, did the, I re read this survey that said the things we worry about can, can be broken down like this. 40% of the things we worry about are things that will never happen. 40% of the things we worry about, typically in our, our space of our day, are things that will never happen. Remember when the bird flu happened? Everyone's worried about getting the bird flu, like getting the bird flu is to be this catastrophe. You know, my, you know how many people died from the bird flu? Zero. Zero people died in the United States from the bird flu. You know how, people, how many people die from the normal flu? Every year, 34,000, but no, the bird flu. That's what's going to get us. How many people are afraid of flying? This worry, I'm worried about like flying. But it, statistically speaking, you are more likely to die walking than flying in an airplane. 
like, oh man, I, now I'm staying at home and never leaving. Um, 2020 once did a, uh, a, a survey, 2020 did a survey and said, what's more dangerous to have in the home, a gun or a swimming pool? And everyone said, oh, a gun, guns are way more dangerous. And unfortunately, you're 100, 100 times more likely to have a swimming pool death than you are to have a gun death in the house. 100 times more likely. 40% of people worry about things, though, that'll never happen. 30% of the stuff we worry about are things that are in the past. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never met Bill and Ted. I don't know how to go back in the past, or Michael J. Fox. I don't know how to go back in time to change the past. But 30% of the things we worry about are things that will never happen. 12% of the things we worry about are health concerns. Which makes sense, but what are the kind of health concerns that some of us are worried about? Uh, remember when we were worried about like, Ebola, anthrax? People, worry, people are worried about heart disease as they're chewing on their Big Mac, going, like, man, I'm scared. <laughs> Supersize that. 12% are worried about um, health concerns. 10% of us, 10% of the stuff we worry about are what other people think. We worry about 10% of the things we worry about. 100% are 10% is devoted to, I'm worried about what other people think about me. Even though I can never affect that, I can never change it. I, can, I can't change what someone's thinking about me. And yet I'm always, I can be 10% of my time, I'm worried about what people think about me. That leaves, that leaves 8% of the things we worry about are things we can actually do something about. 8% of the stuff we worry about are things we can actually do something about. So why don't we do something about it rather than worry about it? Because worry kills joy. Another thing that kills joy. Another thing that kills joy is expectation. I always say this to all my students, I always say, expectation is a killer of joy. Like someone says like, oh, I thought this would be more fun. Oh, I thought this would be louder. Oh, I thought this would be better. I thought this would, I had an expectation and the expectation has not been met and therefore I don't appreciate what I have because I expected something. I expected more than what I've got. Now, sometimes one of the reasons why we have expectations is because we expect that at some point things will be perfect. We expect at one point, some point, things will be perfect. That will make the perfect decision. There's a man, he's a sociologist named, named Barry Schwartz. Barry Schwartz has written a book and he's given a couple talks called The Paradox of Choice. And he said, well, having a lot of choices is good. It's good to have choices because we get to have choice. Choice is good. He says, but ultimately, the more choices we have, the less satisfied we are with what we've chosen. This is from a sociological perspective. He says, I remember back in the day when you used to be able to go to the clothes store to buy jeans, to buy blue jeans. And what you would do is you'd buy your size and they had one kind of fit. And you would get your size and you'd go home and you put them on and they would be uncomfortable. But that's okay, that's how jeans fit. And you keep wearing them until they kind of became comfortable. But now you go to the store and there's straight leg, wide leg, boot cut, casual fit, extra casual fit, baggy pants, gang leader pants, you know, like the really saggy ones. Like, and so you have the idea that if you go to the store and you get the perfect pair of jeans, even if you go home and they fit well, I'm dissatisfied because they don't fit perfectly. Because I have this idea that out there somewhere, there is the perfect pair because I have so many choices, so many options. 134 different kinds of salad dressing, 44 different kinds of spaghetti sauce. Somewhere out there is the perfect with all of our um, students at UMD. They have this idea that someday they'll find the perfect major. You know, the perfect major that, that'll lead to the perfect job. You know the perfect job. The perfect job is the job that you are excellent at without even really trying. And it fulfills every one of your hopes and dreams and you become the best ever without ever having to work very hard. You guys all saw Frozen, right? Okay, so okay, is it Anna who has the glove thing? She has the power, Elsa? Okay, so you guys all have seen Frozen, maybe not. Okay, so here's this, this interesting thing. Here's Elsa, and she's got these powers that she has never used ever. And during the song, Let It Go, Let It Go. <laughs> nice. Um, they close the door, here I stand. Um, so here's Elsa. She's never used her powers because she's held them back. And she says, I'm going to start using my powers. And within two minutes of even starting to use her powers, she's able to build this amazing ice castle on top of this mountain with absolutely no design flaws whatsoever. It is completely perfect. She didn't even have to try. 
She's got powers. We sometimes think that that's how it's going to be. I'm going to find the perfect major, the perfect job. I'm going to find the perfect spouse. You know, back in the day, you, you married the person who was closest. <laughs> but now, you go away to school and your options are just abounding. And then you can even go on the internet and you can find the perfect spouse. Not for purchase, but for like, you know, <laughs> there's this website. You go on catholicmatch.com. That's catholicmatch.com. <laughs> C-A-T-H-O-L-I-C-M-A-T-C-H. I've, I've done so many weddings from catholicmatch.com, but this, it's great. My sister even. Um, but this whole idea, though, that like there's the perfect spouse out there, and if I meet them, I'm going to be perfectly happy, and we will never, ever be upset with each other because of the perfect spouse. And we kind of forget that they're marrying you. <laughs> but if I find that perfect person, then I'll be perfectly happy, and I'll have joy. All these different things that kill joy, expectation, and worry, and shadow missions, and sin. What do we do? Here's the recipe. Here's the recipe to, to reverse the killers of joy and have joy. And I'm going to say it comes down to this, and this is going to be the thing. Intentional gratitude. One of the things that kills, kills the things that kill joy, like nothing else, I would say, is intentional gratitude. There's a couple pieces about intentional gratitude. One of the things about intentional gratitude is it's intentional, meaning it's on purpose. Meaning I have to decide to be grateful. There was a, a, a guy who came to me. He was a sophomore and junior um, at UMD. And he's just a stud. I mean, this guy, is, he, was the, he was one of the top runners in the country in his distance. Just amazingly fast. He had this incredible girl. He was Catholic. His, his girlfriend was also one of the top runners in the country. She's super Catholic. They're going to daily mass. They're praying together. There's an like amazing relationship. He's doing great in school. He's, getting, uh, he's going faster and faster. He's like improving in his sport. And he came to me, he's like, I just, my life is just kind of blah. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, leave. <laughs> he's like, you know what, he said, I get up and I'm just like, I'm kind of like, I guess it's fine, but I just kind of feel blah. I don't have any joy. He said, okay, here's what I want you to do. For the next two weeks, I'm going to invite you, challenge you to do this. For the next two weeks, find 10 minutes every day. And during those 10 minutes, maybe at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day, say at the end of the, end of the day, those 10 minutes, I want you to go over your day and think of all of the things that you were grateful for that day. What are all the good things that happened to you that day? What are all the great opportunities you had that day? To actually set time aside, be intentional about it, and actually say, well, here are all the blessings that I had this entire day, and then thank God for them. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Talked to him two weeks later. And I says, how'd it go? He said, I just, it's ridiculous. I can't even believe it. He's like, there's no more blah at all. I'm just, I'm so grateful every morning I even get out of bed. I'm like, good, because I didn't know if it would work. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this recognition of like, I have to decide to be grateful. I have to make a decision to be grateful. Remember, it's easy to lead, lead a mediocre life. You just have to not decide. But to live a life of joy if I choose to be grateful and decide to be grateful, things can change. And I would say this, when you're grateful, focus on what you actually have rather than what you don't have quite yet. I'll talk to people in the spiritual life as well. They'll be like, yeah, whatever, I've been praying for like two weeks. I'm not even a saint yet. <laughs> like, give it another two weeks. You'll get there. Like, sometimes they'll, they will, 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 we won't appreciate what we have. We'll appreciate, we'll only count up the things we don't have. And we forget that, look, I would say, look back at how far you've come. I mean, even tonight, if anyone's getting discouraged about anything, to realize, you went to church on a Tuesday night for crying out loud. You've come a long way from last Tuesday night. Remember what you were doing last, remember two Tuesday nights ago? Mardi Gras? <laughs> you at Whataburger with your fifth burger? I gotta make it count. Now look at you. Look how far you've come. Whataburger sounds good, doesn't it? Um, no, here's the thing, is like, sometimes we think we should have more, and one of the reasons we think we should have more, or a more perfect life, we don't uh, count up what we have, we count up what we don't have, is because we take our cues from life based off, like, movies we watch. Maybe you don't. The priest standing here with the microphone does. 
And so I think about like, you know, the ways in which movies we've watched or TV shows we've watched, stories we've been told affect the way we think life should be. And so we think of like, you know, here's Han Solo. Here's John McClane from Die Hard. And apparently Han Solo can shoot straight even though he's never practiced versus the stormtroopers whose job is to be soldiers shooting and they can't hit him. <laughs> or John McClane who's getting shot at by all these professional terrorists and professional like mercenaries, but none of them can hit him. Or he gets shot in the shoulder and he's like, oh, keep going. I always thought that that's how I'd be. That if I got shot in the shoulder, I'd be like, oh, I can still move. If I got shot in the shoulder, I'd be like, oh my gosh, done. I give up, whatever. This is not, this is not fun. Um, and forget that we forget, we neglect to remember that those movies were written by adults who are trying to escape reality. When we watch them ever since we were kids, we think, yeah, that's how life is when you get to be an adult. We forget that those movies were written by adults trying to escape reality. So when life doesn't turn out that way, we're like, wait, something's wrong. No, no, no. It's actually what life is, though. Now, that's not an invitation to be cynical. Like, that's all life is. Because it costs no one, it costs nothing to be cynical. It costs nothing to be like those, you know, those people in the Muppets up on the upper balcony. It costs no one anything to be jaded. It costs nothing to be house. Right, Dr. House? He's cynical, he's jaded. Why is he jaded? Why is he cynical? Because his worldview is such that life is an accident and life doesn't mean anything. And the, Dr. House's idea, his worldview is there is no God who loves you. Leo Tolstoy, that's what he said. he said. He said, the tragedy for the atheist is that he looks around this world with all of its gifts and all of its joys and he has no one to thank. Tragedy the atheist, he looks around this world with all of its blessings, all the good things, all the joys. He has no one to thank. That's what house, he has all these incredible gifts, these lives that are saved, and he has no one to thank. So it's tragedy. So who are you thanking? Coming in for a landing here. I'm going to invite you to be very specific about this. Intentional gratitude, but also this. Be thankful for small things. And it might sound silly, but I really mean it. Be thankful for small things. Be thankful for ordinary things. Um, in the morning, to be thankful that you can open your eyes and see. I used to have to wear glasses and contacts. And I remember I had the surgery, you know? And I first opened my eyes after the, the LASIK surgery. And I could see the other side of the room. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I forget to thank God every morning. I can look and just, there's the other side of the room. To be thankful, like, God, thank you so much that I can see. God, like, this morning, I got up out of bed on my own feet. And I stood up on my own. And I know there's people who can't stand up on their own. God, I need to stop and thank you. I can do this. Like, <laughs> I think about going to the bathroom a lot. And I'm fair, very afraid. I'm very afraid the day is going to come when I live long enough that I will need help with that. And I don't want to need help with that. So in the meantime, what do I need to do? Every, actually, in the, in the Hebrew culture, in the Jewish people, they actually had a, a prayer thanking God when you went to the bathroom first thing in the morning. It was actually an official prayer in the, in the Jewish world, relig religion, where you go to the bathroom in the morning to say this prayer thanking God. Thank you that this works still, Lord. <laughs> but to thank God for the small things, because when it's taken away, it is no longer a small thing. <laughs> so to thank God even for small things. The next thing is this. Thanks, intentional thanks, intentional gratitude to carve out some time of your day to be thankful for small things, but also to be thankful to someone. If any of you have raised small kids and you're trying to teach them how to be grateful, how to say thanks, what happens? Uncle Father Mike comes over and gives them a present, and they do, they, they take it and they run away. We say, what do you say? Thank you. And what do you do as a parent? You say, stop, come back here, look at your Uncle Father Mike, look him in the eyes and say, thank you, Uncle Father Mike. <sighs> thank you, Uncle Father Mike. And then run away. Because you know this as parents, you know that when you're saying thank you, you're not just kind of throwing a thank you to the wind, you're thanking someone who gave a gift to you. I'm like the worst person when it comes to receiving gifts well. Because sometimes I'm too self-absorbed. 
You ever think that you're like, <laughs> it's too much information maybe. Um, you ever think that you're like the star in the movie and everyone else, everyone else is just the extra? <laughs> Thank you all for being part of my movie. <laughs> you're gonna be in the credits, don't worry about it. But you realize like actually I'm the extra in your movie. <laughs> And when someone takes the time to write a note, someone takes the time to give some kind of gift, someone takes the time to let you in traffic, says, thank you. You didn't have to do that. It was a complete gift. So to be intentional with your gratitude, to carve out some time, to thank God for the small things, to be able to say thank you to someone. And tonight, just this re reality that we have the opportunity to do this. This is the last thing. Is in a second, as you know, we're just going to have a, a short, very short time of prayer in front of Jesus in the Eucharist. And if there was anything that we could be thankful for, it is, do you realize that I don't even know? I mean, I can't even begin to thank God for letting me be Catholic. For years, I didn't understand the Eucharist. I didn't understand what it was, that it's actually Jesus himself. We'll talk about that tomorrow night, but just the reality of like, I'm like, God, I did nothing to deserve this. Some people say, well, you're a Catholic because you were raised Catholic. No, no, no. I'm Catholic because I believe it's true. And I'm just grateful. I didn't, I didn't baptize myself. I didn't ordain myself. I didn't... I do not deserve the Eucharist. I don't deserve to be a Catholic. I'm way too bad. So it's a gift. Like being brought into God's church is a complete gift that I did nothing to deserve. What we're going to do right now is we're going to have some time, some time of, of song, some time where the Eucharist is exposed here. But I'm going to invite you to focus your prayer. There will be about five minutes of silence. And in that five minutes of silence, I invite you to call to mind what is it that you're grateful for? What is it in your life that's killing your joy? Maybe, it's, maybe you're living a shadow mission. Maybe it's time to start living on mission. Maybe you've been carrying around some kind of sin, and maybe it's time to go to confession. Yeah, but I've been to confession for that so long. God's tired of that. Pope Francis said this. He says, Jesus never gets tired of forgiving us. It's us who gets tired of asking for forgiveness. Yeah, but I can't, I mean, it's, it's been too much. I, God, he must be, he's, I mean, he's tired of me. There was a, a nun and uh, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, or the uh, Divine Mercy Nun, St. Faustina. And as Jesus appeared to her and talk, he was talking to her, and she wrote this down. At one point, Jesus said, what breaks his heart more than anything that we do? You think like, oh my gosh, what breaks Jesus' heart more than anything we do? It's probably something I do. <laughs> what breaks Jesus' heart more than anything else that we do? Think like all the terrible things that we do as to each other as human beings. Maybe all the things we do taking the Lord's name or, or not worshiping him or not whatever. And Jesus said, the thing that breaks his sacred heart more than anything else, is he says, I love my children so much and they don't trust me. They don't trust that I love them when they're at their worst. What breaks the heart of Jesus more than anything is that we don't trust him with our sins. We don't trust him when we've fallen. We don't trust him when we've failed. So tonight, if that's the thing that's holding you back from joy, the secret of the Christian, trust him. Take this time to give your worries to him. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. And experience this infallible, infallible sign of God's presence tonight. Experience the gigantic secret of the Christian. Tonight, you do not have to wait. How, what if I do it wrong? Zacchaeus, there's no wrong way to come down from a tree. You just have to get out of it. And experience the joy of Christ's presence. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, say, come. 
for the spirit and the bride say come yeah the spirit and the bride say come